These are things you should feel comfortable being able to identify on a standard AP film of the hip joint and, and associated bones. Look at this here. This is so radiolucent. Why is this zone radiolucent? Hmm? Because there's space there. What, what's, what means space like air? Synovial fluid. Not synovial fluid is a... Is a cartilage. Yes, thank you. <laughs> cartilage. There's a lots of cartilage on the head of your femur, and somewhat less, but certainly present on the cup of your acetabulum, and that separates these bones and gives you the impression that there's something like air or fluid in there, when in fact it's just cartilage. Quite important, as you will see later in the lecture, we talked about uh, looking at arthritic conditions. Most x-rays are done AP, you know, the person's lying down or, or standing up and the film is front to back. This is also, I guess, an AP, but the legs are in what is called the frog lateral position. This is this often done, and it's obviously called the frog lateral position because it resembles the position of a frog's legs when they're just sitting around doing nothing. Uh, this is what a frog lateral x-ray looks like. It doesn't look like a standard AP film. And I just thought you should see one so you know that uh, you anticipate their existence. They're particularly good at showing a condition known as a slipped femoral capital epiphysis. Those words mean nothing to you now, but they will a little later on. And for various uh, kinds of diseases of the hip joint, which I won't get into. So they often do a frog lateral in addition to a standard baby hip joint film. With the limbs, it's been my practice to show you think bad things that can happen to people. All right? And this is a bad thing that happened to a person. Here is a person who said it's x-ray. Right after an automobile accident, not certain what happened in the accident, but I wouldn't be surprised if she was sitting in the front seat of a car without a safety belt, and she was thrown forward, her knee hit the dashboard, and drove the head of her femur out the back of the acetabulum. As you cannot tell from looking at this, but this uh, in a lateral film we show you is a posterior dislocation of the head of the femur and a major fracture of the pelvis. What they did first was, I'm sure under anesthesia, relocate the head of her femur. So this is with the, with the femoral head dislocated. They relocated the head of the femur. Uh, then they took a CT scan of her. What this is, in fact, is the bladder, you can see here too, full of contrast material. She had been given previous contrast, and it just, by this time, it passed from her kidneys down the ureters into the bladder, so the bladder looks like that. Uh, they did a CT scan of her and did a uh, volume rendering, and you can see the really messed up. You see where her head of the femur blew through the back of her acetabulum <coughs> and broke a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, this can be fixed, surprisingly, with a whole bunch of hardware. All right, and they just screw everything back together again, and I presume uh, she recovered, but I don't know her ultimate history. Uh, there are fractures, so fractures of the pelvis can occur at the hip joint, and then there are a standard series or kinds of fractures of the femur itself, the neck of the proximal end of the femur, and they're named uh, in a sort of logical way. If it's right at the base of the head, that's called a subcapital. Uh, if it's midway through, more or less, the neck, that's called a, or a transcervical. If it is near the base of the neck of the femur, that's called an intertrochanteric because it's between the two trochanters. And then if it's down below the lesser trochanter, it's called a subtrochanteric fracture. Here is a person that has had a subcapital fracture, and here is how it is treated. This method of treatment is called internal fixation. It's similar to what we talked about when we talked about all the plates and things like that, but it's it's internal. So I mean, they drill holes through the through the shaft of the femur and then up through the neck and screw the head back in place. So that's called internal fixation. This is the method of choice if a person is not too old, because when you get old, you don't heal well. I've heard, <laughs> and 
Also, if you are have normal bone density, if you are very old or if you have osteopenia or osteoporosis, certainly they will not attempt an internal fixation to fix this thing. Uh, this is what they will do if you are old, as this person was. Uh, they will simply take the neck and the head of your femur off and put in a metallic one. The acetabulum is not affected in this uh, surgery. The acetabulum is intact. All they've done is replace the neck and the head of the femur. Uh, they will also do this if they have done an internal fixation that failed. Now you can say, well, why would an internal fixation fail ever? And this is the reason why. I think you know, I don't know if you mentioned to them this specifically, but at any rate, the medial femoral circumflex artery is the main supply, carries the main supply to the head of the femur. Uh, in a child, a young child, uh, there's a secondary arterial supply that comes across a ligament, which you probably will never see in this course, but we'll read about, called the ligamentum teres of the head of the femur. It's a little ligament which runs right from the apex of the head to the floor of the acetabulum. And there's an artery branch of the obturator artery which follows that ligamentum teres to the head in a child. But that artery becomes inconsequential uh, when you're quite young. And after that, all of the head of the femur is supplied by a branch of the medial femoral circumflex. The branch of the medial femoral circumflex tends to have an intertrochanteric location, and its branches travel proximally towards the head. So they are real risk if you get a transcervical or a subcapital uh, fracture. Those vessels can be sheared. Also, in any kind of fracture like this, you're going to get a lot of swelling and bleeding into the joint, and the pressure can build up within the joint itself and compress these vessels. So what can happen is, as a result, there's always a risk of a insufficient blood supply to the head of the femur in any kind of femoral neck fracture. And as a result, you can get something we know about already, a vascular necrosis. We saw that with the scaphoid. Or you can just get non-needed. Just the, the blood may, supply may be enough to, to keep it alive, but not enough to allow healing to take place. So if you have a non-union, or you have an avascular necrosis after an internal fixation, then you can have to reoperate, pull out your screws, and actually just replace the head of the femur with a metallic device. You know, here's an avascular necrosis of the left femoral head. This was in a young boy who was uh, idiopathic. No one knew, knew why it occurred, and I don't have any information of how it was treated. Now, uh, here is an avascular necrosis uh, of the femoral head in an older person. I don't know why it occurred. I mean, it wasn't specified whether the person had a fracture at one point, but they didn't treat it, so it's unlikely. But uh, when you have an avascular necrosis there, they just replace the end of your femur. And also, in this case, they replace the acetabulum, too. Uh, here's an intertrochanteric fracture. You don't see it here unless you have really good eyes, and the radiologist didn't see it there either. The radiologist didn't look at this film and did not see anything other than a little fracture of the greater trochanter right here. But when they did a CT and did the volume rendering, you can see right here. Now, this is the left side, right? This is the left side because we're looking at it from the back. You can see right here, you can see the fracture of the greater trochanter, but you can also see this little line here, which is the intertrochanteric fracture. And if you look on... Uh, MRI, you can see here how much different the intertrochanteric region looks on the left side compared to the right side. So you can see it on MRI too, generally due to swelling and, and edema there. Uh, here's how that particular intertrochanteric fracture was fixed, just different kinds of bolts and plates, but again, internal fixation. Here's a person with a subtrochanteric fracture, and of course that requires big rods put down the shaft of your femur, and uh, still they use internal fixation for this. I was going to say, which side has the osteoarthritis? But in fact, if you can't tell from looking at this that it's the person's right side, then you're not observant. <laughs> <laughs> and on the person's left side, you can still see that radiolucency, which we identified as articular cartilage. But on the right side, nothing. I mean, the right side, the bone, there's a sclerotic bone. There's, you, you can see a little radiolucency here, but elsewhere none. 
And that's typical of osteoarthritis. The cartilage degenerates, the two bony surfaces come into contact. That's what generally generates the pain of osteoarthritis, is the contact between these two bony surfaces. And uh, it requires a replacement of the head, femur, and in this case also the acetabulum on that side. Hip replacement surgery, very, very common at a certain age due to osteoarthritis. The person's lucky because they probably only needed one. Uh, things don't always work. So when you have your hip replaced, they don't tell you to go out and run a mile right away. They tell you to be limited activity and certain and there's certain motions you're not supposed to do. I can't remember what they are. And if you don't pay attention to them and you don't follow their advice, uh, this is what happens. You get a dislocation of your, uh, of your prosthesis. Uh, back to our favorite topic, which is all the little ossification centers that form in uh, a youngster. Again, the hip bone, the femur, these are all laid down in cartilage and embryonic and fetal life and then develop from ossification centers. There's a separate one for the ileum, the iliac ossification center. Oh, I think I mentioned this actually in the, pre in the pelvis lecture. Pubic ossification center, and ischial ossification center, and uh, the cartilage in between them was called the triradiate cartilage. I'm sure I mentioned this. And then uh, these ossification centers start to go approach one another. They still haven't by the second year of age. But you can also see a very tiny ossification center for the head of the femur. You know, it looks, it's all cartilage. It looks like a normal head and cartilage, but a little bony center is forming in the middle called the femoral capital epiphysis. Capital referring to head, epiphysis, you know what that is. That's an extra ossification center at the end of a bone, and femoral is obvious. And here it is bigger, a bigger femoral capital epiphysis. And now you remember the term I use, slip femoral capital epiphysis. In between these epiphyses and the shaft of the bone, which is called the diaphysis, is re a remaining zone of cartilage called the epiphyseal plate. And that will eventually seal off when the epiphysis merges with the shaft of the bone later in life. But it stays as a cartilaginous plate until you are pubertal. And if you have trauma to a joint, like the hip, uh, you can drive the epiphysis right off of the shaft, right? You can have a fracture of that epiphyseal plate. And in this case, it would be, you would see the femoral capital epiphysis slide off of the shaft, and that would be a slipped femoral capital epiphysis. And that's what one of the things the frog lateral actually is very good at spotting. And then we start to see later on in life uh, the greater trochanteric epiphysis. This just shows uh, as they're almost mature at nine years of age. You can barely see the epiphyseal plate here. Uh, this bone is starting to fuse. The femoral capital epiphysis is starting to fuse with the shaft. Greater, greater trochanter epiphysis is still not fused to the shaft. And then uh, the only reason I show this one is there is a small epiphysis for the lesser trochanter. Very hard to see, very small, but it has, its, has one as well. So we have one for the femoral head, the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter at the proximal side of the bone. All right, MRIs, this is obviously what? T1, T2. Everybody who thinks it's T1, raise their hand. Everybody who thinks it's T2, raise their hand. You people don't think? That's all this proves. <laughs> <laughs> Lower right corner. Yes, good idea, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So at least one person who read that should have known. Yeah. Um, this is T1, and if we just go down the series a little bit, we're up here at the top of the pelvis. This, uh, uh, this is the this black stuff is the cortical bone of your iliac blade on this person's right side, and then we see some muscles on the inside or. In, internal to the iliac blade and external to the iliac blade. We see the rectus abdominis out here in the front and uh, in an intervertebral disc probably. Maybe bone. No, a bone. I should have known that was not a disc because I can see the black cortical bone. So that's a body of a vertebral, of a vertebra, probably S1. And as we continue down this section, we get to some things that I will label. Obviously, the big muscle on the inner surface of the iliac blade is the iliacus, the biggest muscle arising from the outer surface, particularly 
on the superior part of the outer surface is the gluteus medius, and then we see the gluteus maximus, which always has, because there's so much fat in the gluteus maximus, it always has this real striated or feathery appearance, and it does arise from the very back of the iliac blade as well as from the sacrum. If this is a liacus, I will tell you that this is the psoas major muscle, and I will ask you what one and two are. Anybody think they know what one and two are? Someone has to be bold. How about, yes, sir? No. Uh, the femoral nerve would lie right there in the groove between the psoas and the iliacus. These are things on the medial aspect of the psoas. Obturator nerve? Nope. Sternal iliac artery and vein? Very good. Very good. <laughs> These are the external iliac artery and vein. This harkens back to the pelvis, and we do have a, uh, I believe, a cumulative final exam coming. <laughs> the standard relationship is that the external iliac artery and vein on the medial aspect of the psoas, and there's a fixed relationship between the artery and vein, Dan, aren't there? One is always anterior, one is always posterior. The artery is anterior. Very good. 50 50. <laughs> got it. The artery is always anterior to the vein. A clue here also would be diameter of the vessel, because that's smaller diameter and veins tend to be larger in diameter. All right, so we see that. You can follow them down. We know those are going to, the relationship is going to rotate so that the artery is going to end up lateral to the vein as they turn into the femoral uh, after passing behind the inguinal ligament. All right, nothing very exciting happening here. We still have, psoas is starting to blend with the iliacus. We still have gluteus medius. All right, we see another little muscle popping up here from the outer surface of the iliac blade, but more inferiorly than the gluteus medius, and that is the gluteus minimus muscle, a little fat in between them. That's how we can tell them apart. Gluteus maximus is now... Uh, a lot bigger in the ileus, ileo, iliacus and psoas have fused, essentially to be <coughs> the iliopsoas. There's some abdominal muscles and rectus abdominis. Uh, I'm telling you this is the anterior superior iliac spine, and I know that coming from the anterior superior iliac spine is the sartorius muscle, and I know that just behind the anterior superior iliac spine, on the lateral side of the thigh is the tensor fascia lati. So we can follow those down. Here you see our vessels moving to where they should. There's no way I could look at that and tell you that's the anterior inferior iliac spine, except I know that there's going to be a muscle arising here. There's that muscle arising by a tendon. And if we follow that muscle, it would be the rectus femoris. So I knew that was the anterior inferior iliac spine. Uh, because I knew that the rectus femoris arises from it, and when I follow this down, it will become the rectus femoris. That was just tendon. The, well, the reason it was all black here is because that's where the tendon of the muscle arises. Uh, the, the gray stuff is the muscular flesh, and that's not added to your few centimeters down. And then I'm not uh, going to spend a lot of time, or any time probably, on the adductors. The adductors are very hard. You really have to go back and forth and up and down. Uh, to start identifying the uh, adductors, so you can do that on your own. Uh, we'll point out, maybe from our pelvic days, that there's a muscle which arises from the inner aspect. Here's the ischium. The inner aspect of the ischiopubic lamus and it sends its tendon around the back into the trochanteric fossum. That's the obturator internus. And I think I'll just go down and without. Here's the obturator externus, which arises from the outer aspect of the ischiopubic ramus and sends its tendon to the uh, trochanteric fossa. There's a nicer view of the obturator externus. What's what's right here? Where my where my I'm outlining? Anything? Obturator membrane. Very good. Obturator membrane. They are rising from opposite surfaces of the obturator membrane. Uh, keep on going down here. Nothing. I said I'm not going to pay attention to the adductors. They're there. And, you, and look at them yourself if you want. Ah, question mark. This is tensor fasciae. This is gluteus maximus, and this is 
a black thing in between them. ITB. ITB. Very good. Iliotibial band. And uh, keep on going down without paying attention to the adductors, except one adductor, which is so easy to identify that <coughs> my child could do it. And that's the gracilis, which sits right on the medial side. And my child is older than you by a long shot, by the way. I should say my grandchild. Uh, the uh, gracilis, which is this linear muscle on the medial aspect of the thigh, that's very easy. Uh, now, different sections. You can't find an MRI where they start at the top and go all the way down to the bottom. They just do localized regions. I don't know why. Um, here, again, I've labeled the adductors for you because it's very hard. The adductor longus, we know, we know for a fact that the, the adductor longus and the pectineus are in the same coronal plane. Pectineus more superior, adductor longus more inferior within that one coronal plane. We know that behind pectineus and adductor longus in a further posteriorly positioned coronal plane is the adductor brevis. So we're down here at adductor brevis. And we know that behind the adductor brevis is the adductor magnus. So those things I can tell you. Uh, here's the sciatic nerve, which passes on the back of the adductor magnus uh, to head down the thigh. These things, one and two. I'll follow them down a little. And the fact, if you watch their relationship to adductor longus, that'll be a big clue. Femoral artery. All right. So the adductor longus is split on these two things. So one of the, somebody said femoral artery and vein, and that person is right for one of them. Number two. Number two, Number two that is correct. Number two is the, what I would call, but I, and what clinicians tend to call, the superficial femoral artery and the superficial femoral vein, even though formal anatomic nomenclature is that they're called femoral artery and vein. But I like the clinical nomenclature here. Uh, uh, what about one? Deep femoral artery. Right, deep femoral artery and vein. The superficial femoral artery are, are in the zone called subsartorial canal or Hunter's canal or the adductor canal with the sartorius overlying them and some adductor behind them in the uh, vastus medialis, medial canal. Uh, so we'll just come down. I just this just shows those vessels uh, being separated by the adductor longus. Uh, another person altogether, lower down. Uh, we do see here the sartorius. We see the vein and artery. Uh, here's the gracilis, that big muscle, strap muscle on the medial side of the thigh. Here the feathery gluteus maximus coming in. And now we see, and this is mainly to show uh, the hamstrings in this particular section, we see that the uh, biceps longus and semitendinosus do arise with, a, with a, a common tendon between them. They all both arise <coughs> in the ischial tuberosity, and also arising from the ischial tuberosity is this flat sheet, which is in fact the membrane of the semimembranosus, which is half membrane. You know, it's a tendon, flat tendon. And it will, will eventually give rise to muscular fibers. But when you're up high in the thigh, all you do is you see the tendon, the flat tendon of the semimembranosus. And the sciatic nerve, which uh, is on the posterior surface of adductor magnus, uh, sort of in the interval between the hamstrings and adductor magnus. We just follow these down. Nothing all that exciting is going to happen. We start to see some... Uh, mm, Oh, no, this is the first we see of the muscle fibers of semi-membranosis. Right there. Uh, we now see that when we're far enough down, we see the short head of the biceps, which arises from the linea aspera of the femur and from the uh, lateral intermuscular septum on the back surface of vastus lateralis. And we'll follow these down, and nothing again, nothing exciting is going to happen, really. Uh, you can see the short head eventually meet the tendon of the long head when the, what is this? An exciting thing here? Yeah, that's an exciting thing. Some vessels. Coming down, vessels. In fact, here's Sartorius. 
So these must be the superficial femoral artery and vein. The black one is probably the artery, the white one the vein, based on size alone. I have no other criterion really that works for me. Let's follow those. Artery vein. And what is that? There's a name for that space. Yeah. Adductor hiatus. Right, that's the adductor hiatus. And we see the artery and vein passing through it and ending up in the popliteal region where they change their name to popliteal artery and vein. Uh, nothing. So that was the most exciting thing that happened. And now the biceps is starting to become tendinous, the long head, and receiving the insertion of the short head of the biceps. And semitendinosis is now starting to become tendinous and narrowing down. Semimembranosis stays fleshy, a much greater length of the thigh. Sartorius gracilis has turned tendinous. Sartorius is muscular all the way down to the lower leg. Priscillus becomes tendinous in the thigh and enters the lower leg as a tendon, not as a fleshy structure. All right. A, D, C, B, or A, B, C, D. This is based on a fixed relationship behind the distal end of the femur between three structures. Damn! <laughs> Fixed relationship behind the distal end of the femur of three structures. Huh? Did he leave? He's in the bathroom. He's in the bathroom. Ah, yeah, I like when he stayed with the bathroom to look up the answer and rush back. Just like during a real exam. All right, anybody? Popliteal. Hmm? Popliteal. Which is A? Palpiteal artery, absolutely. It is the deepest of these three structures, the one that's right against the bone, which makes it very hard to get a palpiteal pulse, really. Then the palpiteal vein, then the C. What? It's a, it's a nerve, but what was the name of it? Tibial. I thought I heard an adjective in front of the word tibial which is not supposed to be there. <laughs> that is the tibial nerve. So it's popliteal artery, popliteal vein, tibial nerve. Here it is the peroneal, the common peroneal nerve, uh, sitting on the deep to the biceps tendon. A deep. Uh, all right, and then that's uh, gastrocnemius comes in. And then that's... Okay. All right, here's something, that's, something bad has happened to this person. I've labeled for you the tensor fascia lati. I've labeled... The sartorius and iliotibial band for you. We're up here in the zone of uh, obturator externus here and obturator internus there, and a bunch of adductors. <coughs> I'm going to go through it and someone can yell out what, where the problem lies. Everything looked normal to you, huh? Something wrong with the what? Sartorius. Sartorius is here. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Rex. Very good. Rectus femoris. Something horribly wrong with the rectus femoris. Yes. This is a person that has a hematoma that is bleeding. Hematoma just is a swelling due to blood accumulation. A hematoma in the rectus femoris because they tore the damn muscle. I don't know whether it's punting a football or something. But they tore the rectus femoris and bled into it and diagnosable essentially only uh, by MRI. All right, so I just thought I'd show you that one. That was quite a bit down. All right, knee. I'm not going to tell you, you know, I'm not going to go over these things. You should feel comfortable that you can identify them. I will point out to you that the patella right here, because it is overlies the distal end of the femur, is pretty hard to see. You can see it, but it's not really... You know, it's so clear and separate from uh, everything else, as it is in this picture of the actual bone. Uh, you can also see the very thick zones of radiolucency between the distal femur and the proximal tibia, which is due to cartilage, and especially to a special cartilage called the meniscus, which you'll see Friday. 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 
You know, I'll show it to you here too, but we'll see it. Ooh, tough question. This is a lateral view. This is a medial view. How do you, how do you know that this is a lateral view? Yeah, because you see the fibula. The fibula is on the lateral, uh, articulates with the lateral tubule condyle. So this is the lateral side, and this is the medial side. You can see that the condyle, the femoral condyles, are not shaped symmetrically. The medial condyle has a different shape than the lateral condyle. I won't ask you this, I'll just tell you quick. There's this, there's a little area of concavity or flatness sometimes, or some, my experience, usually a little concavity in the lateral condyle that doesn't exist in the very round medial condyle. And you can identify this on a lateral film of the knee. Here's the very round medial condyle. And here's the lateral condyle with a little zone of concavity right there. The anterior part of the lateral meniscus sits there uh, in case for future reference. And I know Dr. Larson mentioned to you about the patellar groove of the femur. This is the most prominent lip of that patellar groove and that in human beings is the lateral, lateral one. And in fact, you can actually trace it in continuity with the lateral condyle of the femur. Uh, when you do x-ray the knee, you usually do this. And you often do uh, what's called a sunrise view. What is that pointing to? The medial lip of the patellar groove. Good. The surface of the patella for articulating with the lateral lip is generally longer than the surface for articulating with the medial lip because the lateral lip is, is bigger and longer. Uh, sunrise views are very good for certain things. What's wrong? Here's a person's knee. I know what's wrong because of, of the sunrise view. I look at this view, I see nothing wrong at all in this lateral view of this person's knee. The person fell on the knee, it hurts like hell. You look at this view, and if I went really astute, I would say nothing wrong. But I look at the sunrise view, and you can see that there is a fracture of the medial part of the patella. Now, here's a lateral lip which is not all that much more prominent than the medial lip, but the lateral surface of the patella is still longer than the medial surface of the patella. And indeed, now that I look really carefully, I can sort of see a radiolucency here indicating the fracture of the medial part of the patella, but sunrise views are very good for that. Nice cartilaginous zone between a lateral femoral condyle and a lateral tibial condyle. No cartilage between the medial femoral condyle and the medial tibial condyle. And the same, that's on the person's right side, and the same is true on the person's left side. This person has bad osteoarthritis of the knees, infecting the medial condyles on both sides. Um, this is sunrise view, just showing ugliness of the patella. Uh, this is how that's fixed. And you just chop off the bottom part of, of, the, of the femur and the top part of the tibia, and you replace them with metal and plastic. Uh, this thing, which might be viewed as pathological, if you didn't know that from time to time, within the tendinous origin of the lateral head of the gastrocnemius, there can form a sesamoid bone. The patella is like a sesamoid bone, a bone forming within the tendon of a muscle. Well, there can be a little sesamoid bone formed within the tendon of the lateral head of the gastrocnemius, and it's called the fibella, and it's completely normal. Uh, but you have to know, if you're going to be a radiologist, you have to know that it can exist and not interpret it as a pathology. I uh, don't need to go through all of these. You can look at them you know, proximal epiphyses of these bones and the like, distal epiphyses of the femur and the like. Uh, a little later, I will point out here that the tuberosity of the tibia is actually part of its proximal epiphysis. It is, it is not part of the shaft. The tuberosity into which the patellar tendon inserts is part of the proximal epiphysis. And you get this thing. And I, I bet you there's someone in this audience who's had this. Anybody here have a diagnosis of Osgood Schleiders? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> no, it's when it, it pulls off the, yeah. yeah. It, this is what it is. Right. So two, at least two people have had this diagnosis. 
No, yeah, it happens in youngsters I don't, uh, who are athletically inclined. I hope you were athletically inclined. And you get an inflammatory response right at the portion of the proximal epiphysis that represents the tuberosity of the tibia where the patellar tendon is inserting. And you can read this at your leisure. Uh, the radiologist looked at this and said, I think this is osgood schlatter syndrome. It's pain. And uh, it is resolved by, I hope in all your cases, by telling you to limit your activity. Because if you rest and don't run around and jump around, it usually gets better. Not everybody gets this, but some kids do. Aha, the knee joint. The knee joint's really a complicated joint in the sense that it's, here's the lateral femoral condyle, and the medial femoral condyle, medial tibial, lateral tibial, there is in between the condylar surfaces these fibrocartilaginous, almost circular objects called menisci. Medial meniscus between the medial two condyles, lateral meniscus between the lateral femoral and tibial condyle. And they play an important role in supporting body weight, which is too hard for me to explain now, but uh, they, they're functionally important in, in limiting the stress that passes through that joint. And then there are these ligaments called the anterior cruciate and the posterior cruciate. You'll certainly see those in lab on Friday. And here's a schematic. The anterior cruciate so named because it arises anteriorly on the tibia. And the posterior cruciate because it arises posteriorly on the tibia. And then they cross one another. That's the cruciate. And you can tell just from looking at the schematic diagram that the posterior cruciate is going to stop me from driving the tibia posteriorly. And the anterior cruciate, this one is going to stop me from driving the tibia anteriorly. And the anterior cruciate is also very, very important in uh, stabilizing you uh, when your knee is completely erect, as Dr. Larson mentioned, in preventing hyperextension of the knee joint in just posture. The posterior cruciate it gets tighter in flexion, whereas the anterior cruciate is tightest in extension. Now, there's not a football player, hardly a baseball player on earth who doesn't have trouble with these things. And we'll look at first what the normal ones look like, then we'll look at what some abnormal ones look like. We're starting here on the medial surface. Now, you'll see this says a PD. It stands for proton density. I do not know what the difference is between a proton density MRI and a T1 MRI, because they look to me exactly identical. This is proton density, fat saturated, and this is, which means the fat's been subtracted, and this is proton density and without that. So we're going from medial to lateral. So the first thing we're going to come across is the sartorius muscle, as we're passing from medial to lateral. Then we're going to see the tendon of the gracilis, which is deep to the sartorius. And then we're going to start to get into the actual knee itself. So here is the medial femoral condyle on both of these views. This, this one really looks like a T2. I mean, it just, it just does. So I, I guess I just don't understand enough about uh, MRIs to know why this looks like a T2 and that looks like a T1, but they're called different things. Uh, so let's pretend that this is T1 and T2. Uh, this black line here, we know black in a bone is the cortical bone. We don't see that very clearly in this one on the right side because all the fat's been subtracted. But the reason this looks whiter is because it's got a lot of fatty marrow, bone marrow in the distal part of your femur. And the reason the proximal tibia looks right is because all the fat in the proximal marrow of the tibia well, if you subtract the fat image, fat saturated means suppressing the fat image, then it becomes very dark gray, and then you can't really see the boundary of the cortical bone here. Uh, you can see the grayer cartilage, that's the articular cartilage, which shows up in, in T2, and in this modality, it's very white, a lot of standing fluid and uh, cartilage that uh, comes out as white. Going further medial, What is that? Dark structures are cortical bone, fibrous tissue, flowing blood in a lot of cases, air. Meniscus. Yes, 
That is right. That is the medial meniscus, because this is the medial condyle, and that's the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, and we can see the posterior horn of the medial meniscus on the posterior side of this person's joint. And now we keep on passing medially, and we get, oh, this reminds me of something I want to tell you. There are some mnemonic devices I use as well, and one of them is how to understand the positions of the cruciates in relationship to one another. If you take your right foot and put it in front of your left foot, you are now representing the cruciates of the right side. So the anterior is the one in front, and it goes from the in front on the tibia to the inner aspect of the lateral femoral condyle. The posterior goes from posterior on the tibia to the inner aspect of the medial femoral condyle. So just having told you that the anterior goes to the inside of the lateral femoral condyle, and the posterior goes to the inside of the medial femoral condyle, and we're coming from medial to lateral, we're going to come across the posterior first. And in fact, here is the posterior cruciate ligament. From posterior on the tibia to the inner aspect of the medial femoral condyle. Now, and I ask any of my colleagues to weigh in on this, I have read a thousand papers on these cruciate ligaments, and they always said that there's no position in which the posterior cruciate is completely relaxed, and there's tension in it in all positions. But look at this. How can there be any tension in something that's curved like that? I just don't believe it. It always looks like they're completely relaxed. So I think we should just believe that the posterior cruciate is completely relaxed when your knee is extended, even though no book will ever say that. Going further laterally, we come to the cruciate, which rises from the front of the tibia and attaches to the inner aspect of the lateral condyle, which is supposed to be tight when you're standing. In fact, it's supposed to be tight in all positions also, and it really does look tight. Right? So I can believe that. So that's the anterior cruciate. How about number two? Patellar tendon. Very good. Patellar tendon. All right, from the patella down to the tibial tuberosity. All right. And then as we just go past the cruciates, we get into the lateral compartment of the knee joint. Oh, here's the suprapatellar bursa. You'll learn about that later. Uh, and when we get into the lateral side of the knee, we see the concavity, which characterizes the lateral femoral condyle. And we see the lateral meniscus, posterior horn, and anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. That was just the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. And going up the lateral side of the knee, uh, it's something going to this thing here. Something inserting on that thing right there. Biceps femoris tendon. Very good. Long head biceps femoris tendon. Or biceps femoris tendon. Going to the head of the fibula. Yes, sir. Ma'am. Where are the MCL and LCL lig ligaments? You're not going to see it in this kind of thing because... not have thin enough sections to catch it. So they, we, they, are, they are in the same skin. plane as the MRI, in the same plane as the MRI. We're going to see them later. Let me see if I can see. I mean, in LCL, we know an LCL goes from the fibula up to there. So I'm trying to see if there's anything. Is that possibly? That, that possibly could be LCL-ish there? For the medial meniscus, you know how the MCL attaches to the medial meniscus? It yeah, would uh, again, more apparent yeah, well, if you want to look at the MCL and the LCL, you don't do sagittal plane MRIs, you do coronal plane MRIs, and I'll show you a coronal plane MRI later. Uh, if I go all the way back, can we see anything that looks like it might be an MCL? Well, here's the medial. Honestly, you know, that, that there, that garbage there. Sagittal sections are not the way to see the collateral ligaments. All right, what's wrong with this person? Again, we're starting at the medial side and going towards the lateral side. Is the tendon of the gracilis. Medial femoral condyle, medial tibial condyle. Ooh, something bad happened. 
Look at all that fluid in the suprapatellar bursa. So when you see fluid like that in this in this uh, joint space, that means that there's been some injury. Keep on going. Everything looks fine except for that. Nice PCL, posterior cruciate ligament. Ooh. Missing something. Where's the, where's the <laughs> yeah, where's the ACL? See that garbage there? That's this person's ACL. There's a torn, a very bad torn ACL, completely non-detectable as a, as a as a structure. These MRIs. All right, so that's an ACL tear. What's wrong with this one? Again, we start medial and go lateral. Again, he's got fluid in the superpatellar version. Meniscus looks okay to me. PCL. Yeah, that's right. Look at that PCL. That's uglier than all get out right there. And if we keep on going, here's the ACL, and that looks just fine. All right. So this person had a PCL tear. And, you know, that's, uh, you can't beat MRIs. For all six sections show something wrong here. The medial, femoral condyle, medial tibial condyle. You see it better on the one on the right. I'm going to go way back for a second to a different one. This is the way a meniscus should look. Flat. Yeah, I mean, I know you know it. This is a tear of the medial meniscus. This is a, a, a natural posterior tear of the posterior horn of this person's medial meniscus. Difference, different person, different problem, going from medial to lateral. Anything wrong? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's another different kind of tear. Different kind of tear, but a tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. And if we keep on going, will we see something else in this person I've forgotten? PCL looks okay. PCL. ACL looks torn. So this person has part of the uh, unhappy triad, you know, which is an ACL tear and a medial meniscus tear. Here is the issue that you question you asked. Uh, this is a single, I, don't, I didn't do the whole series here. You can see, and it's very interesting, always, always you read that the medial collateral ligament, that's the other part of the unhappy triad, is attached to the medial meniscus. Here's the medial collateral ligament. You know, I see something in between them there which bothers me. But, you know, you always read that they're attached. Uh, here's the lateral meniscus. The lateral collateral ligament is very far removed. That's not a problem very far removed from the lateral meniscus. And again, uh, let me ask you one question. Let me ask anybody. Why do I consider the lateral to be the right? Anybody have a guess? I'll tell you why. Uh, why I do it. I can tell that the shaft of the femur is heading upwards <coughs> and, and to your right. And I know that these are valgus. So if this is heading upwards and to the right, and I know that the shaft of the femur heads upwards and laterally, then this must be lateral on this side. Now, of course, you know you can see all sorts of things you wouldn't see uh, on the medial side here. You can see the popliteus tendon, and you can see the separation of the, of the collateral ligament from the meniscus more clearly. Uh, if that is the case, then the thing which attaches to the inner aspect of the lateral condyle is the ACL, and the thing which attaches to the inner aspect of the medial condyle is the PCL. That's, uh, actually, a lot of slides, but it's gonna, we're going to go through them quickly because I got to tell you, 
MRRs of the lower leg are just impossible. <laughs> They're just impossible. So that's going to be on the Yeah, that's right. Uh, I mean, I even struggle to figure out what the hell I'm looking at. I mean, I can tell that this is the tibia, and here's the <laughs> subcutaneous border, and that's the fibula. And I know that out here should be, you know, the pronoid <coughs> muscles somewhere, and here should be the anterior tibial muscles, and that must be the anterior tibial vasculature. Uh, this is, must be tibialis posterior because here are the vessels which sit on the surface. That means out here must be flexor calicis longus and flexor digitorum longus. And, you know, but this, these are really hard. So you can go through them at your leisure if you want to bother with it at all. I mean, I couldn't even get a really good sense of one. MRI, sagittal MRI of a normal person, tibia, calcaneus talus, tibia, calcaneus talus, some muscles at the back of the tibia, more muscles at the back. Anybody see anything wrong? Achilles. Right. An Achilles tendon tear, complete rupture right there. Here it is. This is like the T2 equivalent. In fact, it says T2 here. This is the T1, and you see it much better in T2 than in T1. It's a complete tear of a normal Achilles tendon. Uh, go through these things very quickly. I just want to say that, you know, when you put a skeleton together, it looks like this joint. You should be able to see it all in one AP shot, but the way things are really positioned, the Malleolus, or the distal end of the fibula sort of overlaps the calcaneus. And if you really want to see a beautiful ankle joint, you have to rotate the foot ever so slightly to put the ankle joint in the right plane. Names of all these bones, which I'm sure you've got. Uh, just mention uh, some orthopedic terms. We know that each one of these bones and joints has a name. This is, would be the uh, uh, talonavicular joint. This would be the calcaneal cuboid joint right here, calcaneal cuboid, talonavicular. Those two joints, which are separate joints with, with separate synovial cavities, are, from an orthopedic point of view, often traumatized together. And so the orthopedics call this thing the Chopard. Well, they don't call it the Chopard joint. They call it the Chopard joint. But it should be called Chopard joint because it's a French guy who did it, um, who identified it. Uh, so it's, it's also called, uh, more anatomically correct, mid-tarsal or transverse tarsal, but the orthopedics pretty much call it the Chopard joint. And then if you take all of the different joints between the cuboid and the fifth and fourth metatarsal and the joint between the uh, lateral cuneiform in the third and the middle cuneiform in the second and the medial cuneiform in the first, all of those joints between tarsal bones and metatarsals those are all lumped together in one name called the, should be Lefron joint, but it's Lisfranc joint uh, by our orthopedic friends. And the reason that they give names is because you can have these joints ripped apart as a group. I mean, you can have dislocation of the Chopard joint and of your Lisfranc joint. And in fact, uh, you now this is, uh, you can do this on your own. Uh, I'll show you one in the later. I guess I should, I should show it to you right away, but I didn't. Uh, again, all of these types of bones start out as cartilaginous things and ossified just like the bones of the wrist did. And we can identify them. I mean, here's talus, here's calcaneus, cuboid, lateral cuneiform. Here we start to see uh, middle and medial. Here's the center for the navicular and the talus. And now we start to see them all. The navicular appears to be the last one to really get big. And you know, that's the way it is. There's also an epiphysis for the tuberosity of the calcaneus into which the Achilles tendon inserts. This is something. You should guess what it is based on. I said we'll see it later. This is a Lisfranc, a Lefranc dislocation. These sorts of things happen if you land the wrong way when you jump down from something. If you are a horseback rider and your foot gets caught in a stirrup, and you get sort of thrown. If someone is stepping on your foot and you fall backwards while they're stepping on the front the foot, that's going to happen. So these, this is a, a, a list front dislocation with lots of other little fractures going on as well. 
Uh, do I need to go into this? I mean, you know, the, this is lateral malleolus, medial malleolus. The two tendons which pass behind the lateral malleolus are deeply the pronius brevis, and then more superficially, uh, the pronius longus. The tendons which pass behind the medial malleolus, I hope you know this, 